alaikum and welcome back to Women's AM. This morning I am joined by Sister Afia, Sister Nusrat and Sister Amina Blake who mashallah has managed to join us. Alhamdulillah. We are discussing moving forward from Ramadan. So don't forget if you have something to share with us on this topic, please call in. The number is on your screen. Or you can tweet us at Islam channel hashtag wham. So before we move on with the discussion, mashallah, we had a sister call in who said that um, her husband doesn't tend to establish prayer regularly and mashallah during Ramadan he does this but she's afraid that he might go back to old habits what you know what piece of advice can you offer this sister to help her in this situation or anyone that's watching who has the same sort of problem um, I think I think first of all um, I mean the, as the was the practice of the Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam that he would always lead by example so the first thing that she should do is to be the best of examples like the Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam um, I mean, there's the, we know there's this amazing story that when the Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam was actually on his deathbed, and 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 his head was on the chest of Aisha radhiyallahu anha, and one of the last things that he said to the to to to, uh, to the people around him um, was the salah, the salah, the salah. Um, the salah is is like um, a direct line, like an umbilical cord almost. If you imagine, you have the mother and you have the unborn child and we are like the unborn child so without this umbilical cord without this connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala our souls will die because the umbilical cord of course gives the nutrition it gives the life it gives the uh, the, the immune system etc etc but ultimately um, I think being a good example because the thing is if, if we keep nagging at our spouses and going on and on and on it, it can create sometimes a little bit of tension mm. and then this leads to people maybe feeling sometimes quite negative um, so if we are very positive in our, our uh, maybe waking up for Fajr and, and supporting him in this way um, this would be a much more positive approach because ultimately the accountability to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is with him and she can't force him into a position where he's doing his abada. I think also to make du'a is very important yeah. because Allah is the turner of hearts. So obviously du'a is a very powerful, yeah. very, very powerful tool too. So just continue to do that as well. I think one advice I would give would be to actually understand, get him to understand, uh, get anyone in this position to understand the importance of salah. Why am I Muslim? Why do I have to do salah? And if they understand the importance of it and understand that actually it's something that we not only do we offer Allah, but it also benefits us as the believer, then we're more inclined to do something because generally as as human beings we understand things by understanding its importance and if we don't understand it we won't actually um, be able to encompass and capture that and use that as a form of transformation absolutely jazakallah khair for that and i hope that whoever's watching finds uh, some benefit from mm -hmm. from this inshallah um well we all engage in acts of worship during ramadan and we feel that unity as well but how can we uh, how can we continue to feel this way um once ramadan has ended or why do we stop feeling this way once ramadan has ended so I'll come to you sister amina yeah, inshallah um i think there are there are many different things i think sometimes we don't have the correct approach to Ramadan itself we view Ramadan as an individual entity whereas we should really view Ramadan as part of the bigger picture Ramadan is a month of, month of training it's a month where we are developing ourselves um, so we do feel closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala during the month of Ramadan however then our niya should be with the, uh, the, the purity the pure intention so that after Ramadan, we need to have this continuity to have the, to be uh, the the sabirin, because Allah ma sabirin. Now, when we look um, at the Sahaba, that even they used to be clustered around the Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and they would have their halakas around the Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Imagine how amazing that is. And then, after they left the Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, they would. Ha he have an iman dip and they would be so terrified because they would think oh, I'm a hypocrite what am I going to do and they used to go to the Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and say Ya Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam why am I feeling like this am I a manafiq am I, am I a hypocrite and of course they weren't it was a natural thing so it's natural that we're going to have a little bit of a dip after Ramadan I think that's I think. a really nice point it's the fact that when you're around righteous people yeah. that it'll help you to get that same feeling mm. that you felt during Ramadan that feeling of like being able to worship and that sense of unity as well I mean so Sister Afia mashallah you're a student how do you find that you know what are the things that kind of help you keep up with that feeling of unity and that that sense of being able to worship so wholeheartedly like you've been doing in Ramadan um, I do think definitely as uh, Sister Amina said that it is um, 
um, genuinely about your atmosphere and the people you're around too. Um, alhamdulillah, like my father, he's always encouraging us to pray. You know, if he can't make it to the mosque, he'll pray uh, in Jama'ah at home uh, and things like that. And I think sometimes the issue um, after Ramadan is we can and dip in our spirituality. Somehow the way we bid farewell to Ramadan or on Eid, we can be a bit too extravagant, etc. And there was another quote that some, someone said something and it really made me think. It said that when you engage in haram on Eid day, you are not celebrating Eid, you are giving shaitan a welcome back party. And it really resonated with me that it's true. You don't just remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in trials and tribulations. So you don't just struggle through Ramadan and, you know, abstain from, from all kinds of sin, but you should do it afterwards too. And we, we should recognize, as you so eloquently put it, that it doesn't stop at Ramadan. It's throughout our whole lives, everything. Our ibadah does not stop in Ramadan. And I think when we have that mentality, it makes it a lot easier to carry on. Yes, subhanAllah. I think that's a really, really good point. I think we tend to forget about that. We think, oh my goodness, Ramadan is over. It's Eid, woo. And then we kind of go, we, we more than slip back into old habits. I think mm -hmm. we go we go way overboard. Alhamdulillah, that's a really, really good point. But what are the things that you know a person should consider after Ramadan, Sister Nusrat? Well, one of the things that people should consider is the fact that just because Ramadan's over doesn't mean that oh, doesn't mean that the struggle um, stops. In fact, you could argue that it intensifies now because now the influence of Shaitan is now in full force. Mm. It's out there. So one of the things that I would very much encourage people to do, even myself, that one should consider after Ramadan, is um, continue the int introspection, like continue being very introspective and self-reflective upon your relationship with Allah. That's something that you always have to keep doing. Not obviously to the point where you keep making takfir against yourself every two. <laughs> minutes but you should always constantly saying think to myself where am I at with Allah how can I draw closer to Allah that and that kind of self-reflection continues um, instead we should only consider um, post Ramadan as kind of like a springboard so that's one general contemplation dhikr is something that should be continued making up any fast sisters you know exactly what I mean by this um, any fast that you have missed whether that's through menses um, you've missed it through illness or, or in any other situation that renders you unable to fast you should make them up and it's something that, that you will have to do because it's part of keeping our duty and obligation to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which is said in uh, um, Surah Tabun um, which is chapter 4 uh, ch chapter 64 of the Quran verse 16 so keep your duty to Allah and fear him as much as you can um, that's something that you have to do um, but in terms of the mist um, other things that we can do you can do superrogatory fasts so um, for some there are some people who perhaps have made have fast to make up from even years before so people who, have, who perhaps may not have been observant they still have to make that so Mondays and Thursdays I think are generally preferable mm -hmm. um, ways to do that so that's one of the things you should consider um, if you are if you're in a, in, in a family where or an environment where it's not as facilitating try and think of how can I continue being social and engaged within the Muslim community because I think that after Ramadan sometimes we tend to be on, have our own little individual kind of um, reality and kind of think to ourselves oh, well, we become very concerned about ourselves so always make sure that somehow you are engaged in that kind of community aspect whether that's through family friends or even just neighbors try and keep that communal but bond. even just to keep up with some of the things that you picked up doing during Ramadan so if you didn't read Quran as much uh, during the year and you've, you've started reading it more often during Ramadan continue with that so whatever was working for you during Ramadan would certainly work for you once Ramadan is over so if you find that reading the Quran um, before you leave the house so you give yourself 10 minutes you know um, extra time to read the Quran before you leave continue doing that or if that means reading the Quran in the evening or listening to it then do that if it means like going to um, a lecture once a week or listening to a lecture once a week continue doing that so I think it's one of those things where it doesn't really stop everything that we've been doing. Like if you've been uh, learning continues. a surah, like for example, like the Surah Mokchan, if you've been learning a surah and you didn't re maybe reach the time limit, don't stop there, yeah. continue going on, you Until know. You finish. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Alhamdulillah, I think that's one of the things that we need to remember is that the struggle continues. I think there's a, there's a also, um, when we're bearing in mind the Quran, we have to bear in mind that the Quran is a living text. And the Quran is for living. And very, very much so, I find that people in Ramadan, they rush through the Quran. And I've got to get it finished, I've got to get it finished. But then, are we really reading the Qur'an from our tongues, like the Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, there's going to come a day when we, there are people, they just read from the tongue, and the Qur'an won't be in their hearts. And having the Qur'an in the heart is reading it and living it. So we're implementing what it says in the Qur'an, Absolutely. and the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and actually living them. And the other thing that we tend to forget, I think, after Ramadan, is that... Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us an invitation every night at Tahajjid time. He sends us all an invitation. And this is to pray our Tahajjid. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala descends to the lowest heaven and waits for our du'a. Yet 
we turned down the invitation. I wouldn't turn the invitation down for my best friend to go to shopping or something. Yet I can turn down an invitation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, my creator, every single night. Just for those two, two four rakah, maybe half an hour before the Fajr. This is an easy way to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there's this amazing hadith, which is in Nawawi's 40 hadith, that says that if we increase in the nawafil prayers, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will love us. Subhanallah, it, so, it also reminds me of uh, another hadith that I read where it says, I think it was hadith, where it says you take one step towards Allah mm -hmm. and he takes it ten towards you. And I think it's just one of those things that we forget that Allah is always waiting for mm -hmm. us to come towards him. He's just waiting. He's just saying, well, you know, when are you going to turn back to me, you know? Mm -hmm. And he asks the angels when he comes to the lower heavens, doesn't he? And he asks them, which one of my slaves is, is calling upon me? And, you know, he, it is true. I think we forget that Allah is so merciful and so loving and he's just waiting for us to turn back, subhanAllah. Forget the the ayah of the Quran. Well, as in the insan la fi khusr. By time, Allah swears by time. Surely mankind is at last. Why are we waiting for next Ramadan to come before we do our ibadah? We should Absolutely. do it now. We don't know if we're going to be here next Absolutely. Ramadan. Absolutely, exactly. Tomorrow is not guaranteed. Subhanallah. Um, I mean, what? Um, what can we do, inshallah, to kind of continue living in the spirit of Ramadan? I know we, t we said briefly a few things, but what other things, practical tips, can we give to anybody that's watching to continue in the spirit of Ramadan once it's over? I think that communal spirit, definitely. So, you know, you have like iftar with your family, and family is definitely something which is, uh, you know, um, kind of talked about a lot in Ramadan and is given attention to. And I think afterwards we should try to kind of maintain our family relations and uh, break iftar, to, uh, well, dinner together <laughs> and you know and it's nice like that and, and, and sister Nusrat said you know um, kind of making up any fast you have and fasting on the Mondays and Thursdays kind of um, trying to keep up with the sunnahs and um, no afil like uh, Amina Blake mashallah so nicely put it that you know Allah will love us if we do that so we should strive to do little things which for us may not seem that important but in, in, in the bigger scale, mashallah, they are. But even if things like acts of charity, so if you're taking part in like some charitable yeah. um, things, activities, events and stuff like that, try and continue that as well throughout the year. So inshallah, um, uh, just last pieces of advice to anyone that's watching inshallah as we're, we're almost done with this section. I subhanallah, it's gone so quickly, Sister Amina. Um, I think we'll go back to saying, s surround yourself with the best of people um, and increase the ibadah and plan for the future. Plan for because the future. It's, it's very important for us to plan what we're going to do, how we're going to increase our ibadah. Absolutely. Email. I think there's a saying, uh, uh, fail to prepare, prepare to fail. So, yes. inshallah, we don't want to be the losers, we want to be the winners. <laughs> Jazakallah khair for that, sisters. With all these, support ta these supports taken away from us once Ramadan is over, it is easy to think that we are on our own again. But there is so much we can do to move forward from Ramadan in a positive and productive way. For example, the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, suggested for us to fast on Mondays and Thursdays. Abu Huraira narrates that the Prophet وسلم, said, Deeds are shown to Allah on Mondays and Thursdays, and I like my deeds to be shown when I am fasting. And this is from a Tirmidhi. So do not despair and follow the sunnah the best you can. Some fantastic reminders about moving forward from Ramadan. And don't forget, if you missed any of today's show, all is not lost. You can catch the highlights from this week on Sunday at 3 p.m. We're off to another break now. But just before we go, inshallah, here is today's ayah from the Surah Mulk Challenge. <laughs> 